The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. Let's go back to the 10th chapter. Let's go back to the same place we were before. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. Tonight we're looking at 19 and 20. There's a lot of doctrines. What we're after is now we're pulling out doctrines uh, that are, the doctrines of the church are superior to any other doctrines. They're, and so what we're trying to do is show different doctrines and how they've been elevated like forgiveness and redemption, and tonight we're going to look at a confidence in God's word. You know, I don't, it's okay that I suppose we don't have a, a great appreciation for the Bible we have. But we have a completed canon. Nobody else has had a completed canon before. Now, Old Testament can canon was completed, but not a completed Bible. I mean, you realize the Bible we have covers revelation from Alpha to Omega. That's amazing. Nobody had that. I mean, and uh, so it's it's pretty unique to be able to have a Bible. And and I'll tell you how much more it's unique is when you when you talk to missionaries on church fields where they don't have a Bible, and if they do have a Bible, it, it can't be read publicly and openly. Like I go to Chick Fil A, I read my Bible. Right, you could, you could. There are a lot of nations where you can't do that. It's uh, against the law to have a Bible or to read it publicly. And uh, but we're, I mean, we're. I, yeah, I'm. Just, I'm reminded myself how blessed we are to have a completed. I mean, we know everything from start to finish. Now we may not study it. We may not know it because we don't study it. But we can. We can know it from start to finish. But we we have the Alpha and Omega of the Word of God, and uh, and we live in a phenomenal nation. As as much as we grumble and gripe about stuff, and and you know, we still live in just a great nation. And sometimes, you know, we don't all get a chance to go to other nations that don't have it very well, and so we have to watch it on the news. But those that go out and visit other nations, military, missionaries, people like that, they come back and they truly kiss the ground. They truly kiss the ground. And um, so, you know, I don't know. It's, but here we are in uh, Hebrews 10, 19 through 25 is one Greek sentence. One Greek sentence. We talked about that last time, but it is one Greek sentence. And uh, it's not the longest one, but it's a long one. And it's just filled with doctrine. I mean, there's just no way to go speedily through this thing and do what the writer wants us to do. And that's to show the superiority of the doctrines of the new covenant over the old. So here we are, and we, we, we looked at 19 and 20 before. And um, I, I want to I go back to look at the aspect of confidence. Um, What's your paper say? Confidence in the word of God? Mm -hmm. Okay. Look at verse 19. Tomorrow night, I'm going to go into the same subject. I'm going to show you some things I, I don't have time to do tonight about this. But he says, since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place. Remember, that's heaven, isn't it? You know, how do I know that? 924. I know that because 924 told me that. Since therefore, brethren, we have the confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh or body. And since we have a great high priest. Now, tomorrow night, I'm going to go into 21, 22 and e explain that aspect of it. But I'm, I'm interested in since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter into heaven confidence because that's what he's talking about look at look at 924 for just a moment 
For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, earthly, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. That's how we know that. So the confidence that we have, now look, you're never going to have confidence that you're going to go to heaven when you die unless you have confidence in your salvation. I'm talking about confidence now. You will go. <laughs> but I'm talking about the confidence. Um, I mean, as a pastor, I wind up with people that become critically ill and everybody around them medically and everybody says you're going to die and they give them, they give them a time, right? You see that? Now, that's a bold idea, isn't it? Because only God determines when you're going to die. And so sometimes they hit it, sometimes not. Now, when they did it to my mother, they hit it right on the numbers. They said my mother had three months. My mother had three months. And that was okay with her because she wanted to live to be the 80, and she did, and she died. And so that was good. She was, And she went to heaven, and that was good, and she was confident about that, and that was good too. She had the confidence. And, and, and I tell you, that means a lot, doesn't Don? When you can sit with somebody and hold their hand, and they're excited about leaving, going to be with the Lord, that's a pretty happy deal. Um, so... But where you get that confidence, so you get confidence in your salvation, then you get confidence from the word of God in your daily living. You begin to see God answer prayers. You see God do things uh, according to the word. You begin to see him work like in Romans 4.21, where it says, you know, what he's promised he will do. And you begin to see him do that. Then it builds your confidence, doesn't it? You know, you know what, what builds confidence in some issues in your life? is habitually having it done, doesn't it? As an athlete, I found that to be true. You know, that's why practice makes perfect concept. Uh, after a while, it just, you know, hopefully it becomes instinctively to you. The habitual part. And if it's a good thing, that's good, isn't it? Well, here he, here he says, Therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place or confident. And where does that confidence come from? It comes from the truth of God's word. You don't have this confidence unless you have confidence in God's word. And listen to me. To have confidence in God's word, you must have confidence in the character of God. And to have confidence in the character of God, you got to know something about the character of God. That he's omnipotent. That he's omnipresent. That he, he's omniscient. Right? That he's righteous and sovereign and all those things. You've got to have. And listen. For me, for me, you know, I can read the theology of God as omnipotent. But boy, when I see him do that in my life, according to his word, I become confident about God and I become confident about God's word because when I read, he, he is able to do what he's promised and I see that he does what he's promised. It encourages my heart. It builds confidence in me towards this walk that I'm asked to walk on earth. Isn't that true in your life? Yeah, sure it's true. And so uh, we're going to look at that after a word of prayer, okay? We just looked at our passage to remind yourself that the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't study it, nor can you apply it in carnality. Evidence of carnality in your life is personal sin. It could be in the category of mental attitude sins or sins of the tongue or overt sins. But it's in one. It's in some of those. So what is the issue? I got to get out of the carnality and back into spirituality. The ministry of the Holy Spirit who dwells in me is not permitted to leave me. John fourteen sixteen. So how do we do that? First John one nine says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us, to cleanse us from all, from our sin and all unrighteousness. What a wonderful promise that is. Mike and I were talking about this earlier. Am I in prayer? Did I say let's pray? No, I thought I was just introducing it. Oh, yeah. Because I can feel my engine starting. Uh, so what do I have to do? I have to confess my sins, don't I?
I have to confess my sin, 1 John 1, 9. If I confess my sin, he is righteous and just to forgive me and cleanse me. Now, I'm going to give you a moment to do that. Now, I have prayer. <laughs> okay, let's do this. Father, how thankful we are for your love, mercy, and grace, and salvation through Jesus Christ by grace through faith and not of ourselves a gift. I mean, how wonderful that is. No wonder there are so many great songs sung by some great writers on that subject matter. Fanny Crosby and people like that has filled our hymn books up. Blessed Assurance. Some of these great tunes that she wrote and others like it. Well, pray tonight, Father, we'd look at the subject of confidence in the Word of God about issues in our life, our issues in our salvation, issues in the Christian way of life, issues in dying. I mean, do you care about that too, Father? No, yes, you do. And what do you care is that we have the confidence, the assurance, the blessed assurance, the blessed assurance. That when we are absent from this body, we will be present of the Lord. Not because of anything we've done. Because of the work of Christ. Who died for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. When we believe it, we receive it. So I'm thankful for that, Father. That is by grace and it's a gift. And I'm thankful for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the word confidence is kind of interesting. The English... There's a couple of different Greek words for confidence. We'll see them tonight. This one is the most prevalent one for it. And you're going to be shocked to learn that it's probably not what you think. Because I think most people, all the emphasis is on your mind. Confidence. The truth of the matter, that's not where the whole emphasis is in this word. It's a compound word. Look at the top of your paper. It, the word par on the front of that, par, risia, parisia, is made up of two words. That first w word on that is P the P-A-R is not actually P-A-R in the root. It's P-A-S. And P-A-S, the adjective, means all. It is, trans, it is given an R because it's a rough breathing mark in the Greek language, and it's kind of technical, but it's changed to identify the next word, resia. Resia is an interesting word because that's the main vocabulary word. It comes from the word you'll be familiar with, rima. Rima. Rima stands in contrast to logos. You have Logos. Logos, for example, in the Bible, if you were talking about the Word of God, Logos would be the whole Bible. Logos would be the whole Bible. Rima would be what we're doing tonight. We're studying a categorical doctrine of it. We're looking at a specific aspect of the Logos. You understand that? That's Rima. And Rima... In the Greek language, rima deals with speech. Speech. It deals with speech. A specific speech. Uh, you know, you go to a mechanic to get s a, some conversation going on between what's wrong with your car and what's going to cost and all that kind of stuff, right? And so it's specific speech. It's not just speak, but, you know, you go to a lawyer to get law, you go to the doctor to get me medical advice, so it's that kind of rima. We're not looking at the whole category of medicine. We're looking at one thing. I got a headache. I can't seem to get rid of it. What can we do about it? Or I got an earache. What can we do about it? That's rima. So this word here, confidence, is made up of two things, and it's kind of an interesting word because it means all speech. Literally, that's what the word means. It is often translated in our English Bible, this one word. Sometimes it's called confidence, like in our text. Sometimes it's boldness. 
and sometimes openly or publicly. So it makes, and so you can see the emphasis of speech because sometimes it's being bold with your speech. Sometimes it's being open with your speech. Always it needs to be confident with it. Are you with me? So that's, that's kind of important because it gives you kind of a different look at this word, the meaning behind it. Because I think if you just say confidence, you're thinking of a di something maybe more than speech, don't you think? Even though if you broke it down, it would probably wind up there, as I mentioned earlier. In the Greek culture, parousia uh, refers to speaking, and this is really important because this is where this word comes from, refers to speaking freely regarding truth for common good, even at personal risk, when, it, when it's in opposition to public opinion. Now, if you know anything about Greek culture and you know some of the great philosophers, Plato and these guys, they were Aristotle, they were always they were always challenging the norm, always challenging things like that, and always in trouble with it. This is how this word got developed. This is a, a word that comes out of democracy. The ability to speak freely on any given subject. And it came out of the democracy of uh, the Greek culture. Okay? Tonight, we're going to look at four aspects of this word uh, translated confidence. And we're going to deal with it in the confidence of the word of God, especially in the category of, uh, you know, one of the things, you know what? Now, you know this because we do this here is what separates us from other churches. We teach categorical doctrine. That's Rima. It's being able to take the logos and reach in there and get specific issues for, for, for specific problems. And so Rhema is a problem-solving device. Categorical Bible doctrine is a problem solving. Well, what's the Bible say about marriage? What's it say about divorce? What's it say about this? What's it say about that? That's categorical thinking. Okay? Now, how you dig it all out, that falls under another thing within theology called Isagogic's category and exegeting, but that's another issue. Okay, so here's point number one. Here's point number one. Uh, parousia was used with courageous, fearless confidence of speech. Okay? And every time you see that, now, when you see this word, it's going to require you to go and look at what's going on. You got, you're, it's going to require you to look at, well, why are they putting him in jail? All he did was tell him the truth. <laughs> okay? So, but... Well, this word, this word means to have the courageous, fearless confidence of speech, even in the face of danger and threat. It was a word behind our First Amendment of freedom of speech. Right? I mean, most people consider us a democracy. When the truth are, we're a republic with a democracy attitude. We have elected officials. I mean, we're a republic with a democracy attitude about how, for example, public speech. And, and the whole concept of the democracy aspect, First Amendment, things like that, came out of this kind of culture. You know, they just didn't sit down. They, they found some things work out of, the, out of this culture. They brought it through through uh, the Europe system of that, brought it here to, to America. An example of Parisia is found in Acts 4. I want you to go to Acts 4 with me. We'll flash through it. We won't study the whole thing, of course. But I want to flash through to show you the concept and how it's being used. And we, we find Peter and John... In Acts 4, they were speaking to the Jewish people. We're, st we're still in uh, Jerusalem, Judea. They were speaking to the people, the priests and the captains of the temple guard and the, Sadducee, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. 
and they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day. In other words, they were preaching the gospel with the idea of being saved uh, through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But many of those who had heard the message, but many, listen, isn't that funny? But many of those who heard it believed. I mean, they were telling them, shut down, shut up, and don't say that anymore. But many people were still getting saved. That's why you don't shut it down. It's because people are getting saved. Now, listen, when you go against that, you've got to be willing to take the consequences of the threat. If you're not, don't do it. Right? Because this is where the courageous, fearless confidence of speech is greater than the threat. Well, see, they didn't, listen, if they had talked, 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 and never had any people change their life, they wouldn't have cared. Now listen to me. But by the time we get to fourth chapter, this preaching has took about a third of the priesthood into Christianity. And people were being saved by chapter four. People were being saved by the thousands, not by the individuals. They were being saved by a thousand and three thousand and five thousand. And a large number of the priests were being converted. That's a threat. Listen, when the gospel's preaching, nothing happens. Nobody cares. You understand? As far as those who feel it to be a threat. And so this is what's going on. You, mean, yeah, you know, you got to, if you want to know about all that, you got to read chapters one, two, and three. All right. So they laid hands on them, put them in jail until the next day, and it was evening. All right. So they put them in jail. They put them in jail. Now, let's go down to verses. I just want you to jump. I want to show you a few things. So they put them in jail. Uh, and they've got to go to trial. All right. They got to go to trial. Verse nine. If we are in trial today for a benefit done to the sick man, they healed a guy, and they went, oh, you can't do this. It's the wrong time, the wrong day, yada, yada. And so they're, 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 they got them on all kinds of counts. They got, they got a whole list of charges against them. Verse 10, let it be known to all of you, here's, the, here's what got them in jail. Now they're in jail. Now they're in court for the same thing. <laughs> this is bold, confident speech. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you today in good health, the guy who they healed and got saved. He is the stone, talking about Christ, Jesus Christ. He is the stone. Now they're into, their, they're into their Bible pulling out scripture. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builder of, by, by which became the very cornerstone. There is and he, there is salvation in no one else, for there was no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which they must be saved. Now tell me that that's pretty bold speech. You know why they, they could be bold in the face of that? Now listen, they're put in jail for that. They're in court and they're telling the court the same thing. That, <laughs> that's parisia. That's parisia. All right, then uh, let's see what else happened to him. Look down at 16. We'll go, let's drop down to 16. In verse 13, they observed the confidence of Peter and John. They, uh, they understood they were uneducated uh, and low balls. And seeing the man who had been healed, and so we drop down to 16, saying, that here's the council now, here's the court. What shall we do with these guys? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may not spread any further among the people, see, listen, that's how you know you're on top of your game as a Christian with the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's people are getting born again and lives are being changed. 
And when they had some of them, they commanded them to, to speak or uh, not to speak or to teach. That's publicly or privately. Before they told him you can't speak publicly. Now they told him you can't do it privately, which means in, in your house or in private. You can't do it publicly and you can't do it privately. At all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, <clears throat> you will have to be the judge. But for us, we cannot stop spreading what we have seen and heard, the truth. But when they threaten them further and let them go, and then the subject goes on to another way. Listen, that's parousia. That's guys who know that they have the freedom in Christ with the responsibility of confidence to, pre to preach the truth of the gospel of Christ because it is the gospel of Jesus Christ that has the power to save and change. And when it's preached with the right message, with the right mechanics, if you believe you receive, it changes people's lives. And we're all in this room to testify to that. Agreed? as parousia, the confidence, the boldness, the openness in the face of threat. I have to tell you the truth. That's, that's, that's the confidence behind this word. And listen, let, let, let God take care of the chips. You know, well, we'll see where the chips will fall. Well, we'll just let God take care of the chips because he took care of everything else. Listen, the biggest thing that God has to take care of in your life and everything else is, is small stuff, is your salvation. Once that thing is done, everything else is a, is a shoe fit. If the shoe fits, wear it. It's a shoe fit. When he does the toughest and hardest thing in your life, he's got everything else. Hoo Right? Don't sweat the small stuff. Sweat the, big, sweat the big stuff. You see, this is a powerful word, and this is a, Acts 4 is a great illustration when it says, now they observe, that's the, the religious hierarchy, they observe the confidence of Peter and John, even when they understood that they were uneducated and untrained, they were still amazed at what they could get done with, with nothing going on. I mean, no education. I mean, these are nobody from nowhere. And they're turning our city upside down. You know what does it? It's not starting a church. It's preaching the gospel. Okay. I mean... You preach the gospel, the church will start. If you don't preach the gospel, the church won't start. It's the church of the born again. You got to have born again people. And I talked to a guy the other day, you know, out in Moody. I talked to a guy, got saved. And when the Bible says newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, you, you need to be refreshed in, in your soul to see that. I mean, that guy would have stayed with me. I mean, I thought I was going to have to take him home. It didn't matter. He wasn't interested in no 15-minute sermon. He wasn't interested in no 20-minute sermon. He was interested in getting answers. He was so excited. And I went, oh, man. Oh, man. It's being able to feed that baby that's just alive and just full of life. You can even smell the life on a baby, can't you? Can, nobody has a smell like a baby. Right? It's the smell of life. That's what it is. I mean, you can smell life on the front side and death on the back. Yeah, you can. Yeah, it's the darndest thing. 
And listen, when you see that newborn babe in Christ, I mean, you could just, I mean, his enthusiasm just puts a sweet aroma in the room. It just, it just fires you up. And, you know, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. I'm just telling you something you know. Uh, here, and here's a great passage we quoted all the time and don't understand the conditions that it was quoted in, Acts 4.12. There is salvation, soteria. Soteria is where we get soteriology, which is a name for the study of salvation in theology. There is salvation and no one else. How bold were they? They put him in jail for preaching that message. They took him to court and they preached it again. Thank you, God, that I have the opportunity to talk to more people about Jesus. Don't you love that? Well, you can't do that here. Do what? Well, you know what you were talking. Oh, you mean that there's the salvation of no one else? But in... <laughs> you love these guys. There's salvation of no one else. There is no other name under heaven. And so they tried to stomp that name out. They had theft. They could do it with the people. But listen, they were getting so many people saved that if you got one down, they just, listen, they were saving them by the thousands. You think, what are they going to do? They're going to go out and preach the gospel. That's what happened to me. That's what's going to happen to this young guy, too. I guarantee he's going to do it. I said, who, who, he, listen, he already started a list of all of his friends. Didn't you, don't you remember when you did that? As soon as I got saved, I, I started making a list. I wanted to go and tell every one of my friends, my f family members and everybody. I made a list of everybody. I didn't want to miss anybody. I wrote them down. <laughs> and eventually we got them too, but it took us longer than I thought. It took me longer than I thought. What a wonderful verse. What a wonderful, what a wonderful. This is the young church on fire for God, Gary, on fire fire for God. Listen, you should, your fire should never go out. You should be stronger in your fire for God as a mature believer than you were. Uh, I mean, these guys are still, they, you know, they're still in a growing stage, aren't they, Peter and John? And, uh, well, boy, they got one thing right, soteriology. There is no other name. I love that boldness. And they say, you better shut it down. Nah, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think I can do that. I've been born again, buddy. Born again. And now they say in verse 29, they say to him, and, and, and they say, and now, Lord, take note of their threats. <laughs> this is their prayer. Now, Lord, take note of their threats. And grant that your bond servants may speak. That's communicate with all confidence. Don't you love that? I'm looking out for these guys, Father. I'm not hiding from them. So how about you deal, give me a little help on this? <laughs> give me a little help from your side. They hold positions of authority because they're there for you, because you've appointed them. I need a little help on your side on this deal. I love that. Here's the second point. Now, again, we're learning about this word, confidence, parisia. Parisia was used four times in the book of Hebrews. And listen, one day I'm going to come back. I'm going to do a special study in this. This will be a great study for us. It's in the third chapter, verse 6, the fourth chapter, verse 16, the champ chapter 19, 20, where I am tonight. Uh, actually, I put 19, but it's 19, 20, isn't it? And then uh, 10, 35. And let me tell you, he looks at this idea from four different viewpoints. This word, it's always parousia, and it is so good. It'd be well worth your look at it. One night, one time I'm going to come back. We're going to do this one. I wrote, I wrote down, this would make a great special study, Ron. Okay. But we're only focused on one. That's John. We're looking at uh, Hebrews 10, 19, and 20 tonight. And, and uh, here's what we're looking at. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence, we have it. It's a present active participle. Listen, you know, you know something about confidence? You have it, and the only way you can hold it is when the opportunity comes to exercise it. You have confidence. But listen, the real test is not that you have it. The test is, will you exercise it? See, Acts 4, right? Will you exercise it under threat? 
or when it when it uh, when it's in opposition to public opinion, you know, where everybody goes like, "Oh, you don't really believe that, do you?" And you're only one in the room that says, "Yeah." The only one, and everybody goes like, "Oh," and they all isolate you. Listen, I remember I worked for Southern Acid Gas, and when I went back to work after I got saved, I went back. I was on fire. And everybody, nobody, listen, by the end of the day, riding back on the truck, on the back of the truck, riding back on the back of the truck, no one would sit with me. I sat alone because everybody who sat by me, I told them about Jesus Christ. And listen, that message has not gotten old. Horton says, if they step into your six feet, that's for sure. Even a lion would eat you in six feet. If you stepped in, even a lion would eat you in his six feet. He said, I, I live by that model. And of course, he says, we have confidence to enter the holy place, talking about heaven, by the blood of Christ and by the body of Christ. That makes the Eucharist important to us in the church, doesn't it? This is a reference to confidence in categorical Bible doctrine, this idea of entering heaven at death. In Hebrews 9.24, we know that's what he's talking about. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but rather into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. The word for means on our behalf. In 1 John 2, 1, it says that when he, one of the things he does in session, seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, is our, be our advocate. Listen, I don't know if the boys knew that, but John sure learned it in Acts 4, didn't he? Because who wrote this? Who wrote? Peter and John are in Acts 4. Who, who writes he's our advocate? Right? John. And what did he pray going out of that meeting? Father, you got to deal with this old group over here. And then God developed a whole categorical doctrine on John's behalf of that we have an advocate in session, always in session on our behalf. Didn't you love that? That's for you can be bold. You be bold. Listen, the word advocate, John says the word advocate means you're covered. Don't you love that? Throw that threat away. Listen. They put the muscle on them. They put the word on them. They put the muscle on them. They put the word on them. They put the muscle on them. They put the word on them. Is that not simple enough? That's all you do is you put the word on them. You got no other reason to be there. It's not muscle against muscle. This is the power of the word. Listen, and the power is in the word. Romans 1.16, the power of the gospel is to save you. To save you is in the power of the gospel to those who believe. And in the midst of all this threatening and all this warfare and, you know, all the media out against it and all that kind of thing, you know it would be. What, what are they? they just preaching the gospel. And what's happening? People are getting saved. Lives are being changed. It's, it's turning their society upside down. They don't like that. You know, it's called the swamp today. What a great name for that. The swamp. They've, there's always been a swamp in, in regard to Christianity, in regard to the truth. I mean, that's a war you fight all your life. What's the answer? You take the gospel into it. You take the gospel into it. You barge right into it. The gospel has the power to change people's lives, change their attitude, change their lifestyle, right? Did mine. It put, put a, it, put a, it put a spring in my step I still have. I mean, where's that spring come from? Where's that energy come from? Where does, that, where does all that come from, Ron? I'll tell you where it comes from. It comes from my salvation, buddy. I'm in this thing to the end. Now, I don't know I have a spring, but people say, you got a spring in your step. I go, I don't know what that means. I think my spring is kind of sprung, but. <laughs> but, but I'm thinking when I was 16 or 20. But uh, I guess they think I'm still mobile or something. I don't know what they mean by it. I don't know. In fact, I don't even know what they mean by a spring because mine is sprung. So I don't know. But I do know that. But we have an advocate. 
and John writes about this, and between Acts 4 and 1 John 2, the, a whole doctrine had been developed in John's heart on that very issue, as he, he is our advocate. I, I, I just love this stuff. The early church was imprisoned for speaking boldly on this subject. It is, it is covered throughout the book of Acts. And if you want to see the worst of it, you study the life of Saul of Tarsus. And there are three chapters in the book of Acts you should write down, 9, 22, and 26, because he gives his testimony <laughs> either in the street or in court. There was only two places he was. He was either, well, three. He was either on the street preaching it, you know, in the, out in the public, out in the public preaching the gospel, or he was in court preaching it, or he was in jail preaching it. This guy never went to Disney World. His Disney World was either court or jail. Well, where'd you go on vacation? Well, I went to Caesarea, and from there I went to Rome. Uh, that was my vacation this year. Well, how did it work out? Well, it worked all right. I got everybody, uh, they, they, uh, they chained me uh, to Roman soldiers, and by the time we got to where we are going, I had them saved. They hated to keep me chained, and I said, that's all right, boys. Uh, I am free in Christ. And they thought that was pretty amazing. Oh, you say, well, he was an apostle. Oh, yeah, no, he wasn't. He was born again. Oh, you say, he was the apostle Paul. Yes, you're right. He was Saul of Tarsus first. Don't forget that. What changed him from Saul of Tarsus to the apostle Paul, the beloved apostle Paul? What changed that guy? He'll tell you in a heartbeat, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ came and died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead. When you believe it, you receive it. It's the only way you get it, too, by the way. The rest of it is gobbledygook. All right? So, wh listen, you, listen, l let's, l just for example, I'm not going to go anywhere tonight anyhow. So, let's go, <laughs> let's go to 22. I've been going someplace, but I'd probably go where I thought. Acts 22 uh, 15 through 22. Now, Paul's going to do this. Every, he gets saved in nine, and then his story is in court from that point on, 22, 26. He gives his personal testimony. That's what it's about. And here we are in 15. I just, pull, I just pulled part of it out. It's well worth your read, however. In 15, he says, for you will be a witness for him. To, he's talking about how, how he, uh, his, he's in court before the Jews. He said, this is how it turned out. You will be a witness for him to all the people, or to all the men of whom you have seen and heard. And now why do you delay? Arise and be baptized. No, let's see. I wanted to go 15. Well, I'll stay on it, 15 through 22. Uh, be baptized and wash away your sins and call his name. And it came about when I, he's telling, he's giving his testimony. And when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I, that I fell into a trance. And I saw him say to me, and I saw him saying to me, make haste, get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves understand that in one synagogue after another, I've, I used to imprison and beat those who believe in you, in thee. And when the blood of thy witness Stephen was being shed i also was standing by approving and watching out for the clothes of those who were slaying him and he said to me go for i will send you far away to the gentiles and they listened to him up to this statement and then they raised their voices and said away with such a fellow from the earth for he should not be allowed to live This is Paul. What's he talking about? He's talking about how the gospel of Jesus Christ changed his life dramatically. Three. I'm going to cover three and then I'm done. Uh, yeah. Let me cover three. The only way into the presence of a holy God in time and eternity. Now, it's important, time and eternity. Only way to enter into the presence of a holy God in time or eternity, or as well as eternity, 
is through the blood and the body of Jesus Christ removing the sin of the world. You know that that John, like I wrote down here, John 121, behold the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world. Or um, 1 John 2, 2, he is the propitiation for our sins and not only for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. Uh, you know, what this, what this goes to, the new and living way, we did our last study uh, was John 14, 6. You remember that? John 14, maybe on your paper, is it? John 14, 6. And then Hebrews 10, 20, where it's listed again, right? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Well, listen, everybody took that serious, didn't they? In fact, we still take it serious, don't we? We believe that. I believe that with all my heart. Uh, while in the Roman prison for preaching the gospel of grace salvation, Paul called for the leading Jews. This is Acts 28. This is Caesarea, and then he goes to Rome, and, and you know, th this is... This is tough stuff he's in. While in Roman prison for preaching the gospel of grace salvation, Paul called for the leading Jews to meet with him in Acts 28, 17 through 22. And here's what he said. In here's what is said to him in verse 24, 16. No, this is in 28, 22, but I'll go back to this in a minute. But we desire, here's what they ask him. And this gives you kind of an insight into the way the ways Jews thought about Christianity in the first century. And they believe this across the board because the, 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 you're finding this attitude and belief everywhere you go now with the Jews. We desire, the Jews are saying, we desire to hear from you what your views are for concerning this sect. Now notice the Greek word, heristes, that's the word heresy. They saw Christianity as heresy. In Acts 24, 16, it was called the way. And the sect that they're calling is Christianity who was called the way. And they consider it, the message they're preaching, they consider it heresy. It says, we desire to hear from you what your views are for concerning this sect. It is known to us that it is spoken against everywhere. In other words, the Jews, that is Jewish thinking across the board, everywhere. They have spread the word like wildfire that, that this is an opposition to them, to the Jewish faith. In, that, in the enemy, he's just as, as mean, isn't he? Acts 28, 28. Therefore, let it be, that's a command. Notice that's an imperative. Therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles because they will listen. Now, you would have thought the last guy that God would send would be Paul. You, th you would think that he might send him back into the group to tell him the story. Listen, we were so wrong in doing this, and let me prove my case to you. When he did, they tried to kill him. They were not going to listen to it, were they? They were not going to listen to it. But he, he kept preaching it to them because there was always somebody who wanted to hear it, a guy like Nicodemus in the hierarchy of religion. Well, anyhow, uh, Acts 28, 31, it says that he was preaching, which means public. He was preaching the kingdom of God and teaching that's private concerning the Lord Jesus Christ in all open, in, that, in context. That's what that means in context. That's what it means in context. Okay? What the preaching means, they were doing it publicly. They were getting in trouble. Then they shut them down, and they tried to shut them down. It, take them, put them in jail. That shut them down. They released them. And they went to homes and started doing it. Th then they had to come back and tell them, you can't do it there either. Okay? Uh, and so you, then you go underground, and they'll hunt you like a, like a, a mold. I mean, they're not going to settle to have the gospel. Okay? You, you, and listen, when your nation does that to you, then this is where parousia comes, becomes important in your life. To your nation, to your people, this is how important it becomes. And listen, when Paul went, he told the nationalists the same thing. 
if he went to Rome, he told them this. He said, listen, they'll, they'll probably shut you down. So you got to, there's some things you have to be, you have to understand and be bold with. Like in Romans, what I quote 16 all the time. Verse 14 says, you know, be not ashamed. Be not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, be eager. Don't be ashamed to be eager to share it. And and what what's the worst thing they could do to you? Well, they could tor torture you, yeah. What would be worse than that? Death? No, that would be the best thing. Probably the worst thing would be they could torture me. Listen. That's how the enemy fights you in warfare. Don't you understand that? They did change that. They did change that. Well, this is, that's the way they fight. Propaganda first. Threats. Torture. And death. But Paul, the, the Paul, when they started doing that, they said, well, listen, just skip the torture part. Just put me to death. I'm okay with it. So you can't tell them that. Right? Can't tell them that. Listen. Right up till they, listen. You know how, you know how Paul died? They beheaded him. It's the only way they could shut him out. Listen. The only way they could do it. He was trying, if I know Paul, he was trying to convert the guy that was going to chop his head off. Listen, do what you got to do, buddy. I understand it. it's going to be okay. But be saved because you do not want to be where I am right here today, do you? Uh -uh. I mean, not without the confidence that you're going to meet the Lord Jesus Christ and be in a good situation forever and ever and ever and ever. You know he did it because that was his life. You know he did it. But every every time they chained him to anybody, he led him to Christ. This is the best day of your life, guys. Now I know why I'm here, right? I uh, just I just love this stuff. Well, anyhow, listen to Ephesians, and I'll wrap this up. Don, you got it tonight. Uh, when I wrap up, right? I mean, it's normal, but I'm just saying it. Listen to, listen to Ephesians 3, 11. I, I saw Ma Marion gone, and it, it, then I remembered they were on vacation. It kind of threw me for a loop, and not because he does it every time, but I, I expect Marion here, and he's not here. So it threw me for a loop a minute. Um, that I, may have a spring, I may have a spring in my step, but I don't have one in my mind, apparently. Uh, this, in accordance with the eternal purpose, the eternal plan of God, which he carried out in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness, there's our word, and confidence, that's a different word. It, that word deals with assurance. That we have confidence. We have boldness and assurance that we have access through faith in him. I love it. That's just too good. All right, Don, let's have a word of prayer, uh, and we'll, we'll get these guys out. Father, we're so thankful. For these that have visited with us tonight for Bible study through automobile coming into the local assembly as well as those who were not able to make it but tuned in with us tonight on a wonderful study about Parisia, the confidence to be bold and openly with the gospel of Jesus Christ, a clear message, a clear mechanics of how to be saved, believe and receive. For it's a gift of God's grace. Oh, Father, I pray that we would all be bold wherever we live with the gospel of Jesus Christ because it changes lives and lives changes society and society changes nations. And we are, the Christianity is nation building through one-on-one -on -one conversion. We're so thankful for that, Father. Encourage our hearts tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.